Welcome back to this session on the valuable lessons for pharmaceutical manufacturing during a pandemic. Um, we all hope that we can learn something for after the pandemic and unfortunately, potentially for the next one. I'm really pleased to welcome John Chaminsky, who is the chair and CEO of Catalant. Um, Catalant has been uh, recruited to help make the Moderna vaccine and play an important role in producing other COVID-19 related products. Uh, previously, uh, John was at GE Healthcare and he had been at Catalant for over 10 years when the pandemic struck. And so my first question to you is, what was the business like before COVID and how did it change? Well, you know, before COVID, I would say this has always been uh, a heavy, fast-paced operating business. We manufacture 70 billion doses per year. We have 40 sites. Uh, we have 7,000 products that we make for our customers. So it, it's it's a very, very active company, um, on-time delivery, reliable supply of all the medicines to patients is absolutely critical. So that was before COVID. And then you put COVID on top of that, where you need to scale up for COVID vaccines and treatments while ensuring the supply of all these other important medicines. Uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it was quite a shock. The other thing is we've got, uh, again, over 15,000 employees. And in March of last year, we had to de-densitize de our sites. We had to basically take 25 to 30 percent of our non-site required employees, send them home, make sure that they were going to be productive from home uh, and still be able to run our factories and take on all the new demand uh, from the COVID vaccines and uh, the COVID, uh, COVID therapies. Um, I would tell you that the change in speed has been breathtaking. Uh, we also learned that we can go fast in this industry. You have to remember that, you know, this is an industry whose timelines are measured in years and decades. So from contracts being put in place to secure capacity from an initial discussion to signed agreements in weeks, not months and quarters, in addition to basically cutting capacity. So capacity projects, their timelines, we, we literally cut them in half because we had to put in significant capacity to be able to meet the demand of, uh, of, the, of the vaccines. And I'll just give one example. In, uh, in one Catalan case, we went from what's called a technology transfer of a product uh, from a customer to our site. Uh, and we were able to uh, do that in, uh, from the tech transfer to the re release of the batch in 10 days. And that's just insanely fast. I mean, that's that's normally done in multi-month time frame, if not six months to sometimes a year for doing a, a, a complex tech transfer. So again, we've learned we can go fast or faster, I should say, um, uh, in the environment. But it's uh, it's been quite a time the last the last year. Yeah, you must be very tired. Um, 10 days is a tiny amount of time. So what is you know the practice behind that change to be able to make it happen much faster then? It's, it's, it's actually an intense amount of collaboration that's now happening with customers, suppliers, and regulators. And quite frankly, just finding new ways of doing things. This is, this is an industry that is highly regulated. Every step is documented. Every, everything that you do uh, has been prescribed in a document and finding ways to keep that same level of compliance as required and doing it in a much shorter time frame by making it a priority, by making sure that you, you push aside uh, non-essential things or, or work-related items not to that project to make room and get it done is what we figured out. Um, we found new ways of working with regulators in terms of doing uh, either uh, remote inspections, hybrid inspections, uh, working with uh, working with customers, uh, you know, in our industry, we usually contract, for example, uh, for five to seven years on a commercial prod uh, products that could take six to nine months to negotiate that co uh, contract. We didn't have that time. We needed to be partnered with that customer in uh, uh, a very short period of times, and we just figured out how to do it. And the partnership conversation uh, got very. Uh, intimate. It happened very quickly, and we were able to just do things on a different timeline. I mean, 
you, we, we've learned we can go faster. We also have another phrase that we've used. We actually had uh, some elected officials and Operation Warp Speed uh, came to our Bloomington site and my COO, Alessandro Maselli, uh, when asked about, you know, how are you doing everything that, that, that you're doing? He said, uh, you know, the possible is not impossible. It just hasn't been done before. So I think, you know, the pandemic mm -hmm. and the challenge in front of us has really, you know, pushed us to uh, find new creative ways of working that hopefully we'll be able to take forward in the future. Yeah, and you know, it's really interesting the point you make about regulators because we've heard a lot about how they sort of worked and had day-to-day -day contact during the trials um, for development of those trials. But also at the same time we were seeing manufacturing happening. What was the difference in terms of doing manufacturing sort of at risk and, and when were you arranging those contracts? So, first of all, I have to say that, um, you know, one of the things that, that really needs to be highlighted was, was Operation Warp Speed and what it was able to do to basically enable the industry. So, basically, you know, you had the government picking, uh, this is in the U.S., picking, you know, basically uh, six uh, suppliers with different technologies and then basically funding them, knowing that they were going to get that funding, whether or not the product got approved or not approved. They did that with speed. That was also then transferred from our customers coming to us. And quite frankly, Catalan was in a was in a, a, a very enviable position because at the beginning of the pandemic, we had uh, coveted assets uh, that we either had capacity on or were building future capacity for the strong growing biologics uh, uh, biologics pipeline. So. We had the capacity and again, we just, they came in and you had the backstop of Operation Warp Speed in many cases. And then uh, you just had basically the challenge of the pandemic that brought everything together. Your point around at risk, I would say, is a little bit more of uh, a situation of just in time. It's probably the first time in the industry where we're literally going from discovery to clinical trials to manufacturing uh you know to emergency or to emergency use authorization and manufacturing literally in a you know basically a, a, a nine to 12 month period depending on on, on what uh biopharma you were so it was uh, just quite impressive overall uh i don't know that the industry will be able to maintain that level of p uh, speed and pace but certainly it has taken us to a whole new level Mm. But there have been bottlenecks, right, in terms of issues with availability of equipment, equipment breaking down and um, supply chain. You obviously are reliant on the whole supply chain behind you. Um, you know, what have been the biggest challenges and, and lessons if we were going to try and solve them for the future? Well, so look, going into the pan, first of all, I'll, I'll, I'll make the following statement, which is I think the uh, the pharmaceutical industry has some of the most robust supply chains uh, in the world across all different industries. And the reason is, is when you have an essential medicine that is either life-saving or life-enhancing, you cannot uh, have a situation where you're out of stock, you are out of supply. So we've got, I would say, a very robust supply chain. However, now the pandemic hits. And quite frankly, um, that level of robustness was challenged. Uh, and quite frankly, we didn't actually know as much as we thought we knew about our supply chains. Uh, you know, from a Catalan perspective, for example, much of the time, API is actually supplied to us from our customers. So we don't have visibility from where that API is coming from. It could be coming from China or India or other parts of the world. And so one of the things that we, we did in Catalan, and I think across the industry, probably similar things were done. We actually placed orders uh, for, for, for all the products that we were gonna produce for the year where we, we had kind of forecast for it. And we, we basically put that demand on our suppliers just to stress test the supply chain and find out whether they were gonna accept the order, defer it, or just not respond. And that gave us lots of visibility, if you will, but um, throughout this, there's been an insatiable demand for all of the biologic consumables uh, that go into single-use uh, bioreactors. Um, obviously, you know, from a drug substance standpoint, which is the active pharmaceutical, if you will, for uh, for biologics, and then obviously the final finished dosage form of drug product, whether it was, you know, 
uh, single-use components all the way through the vials. Just you had this voracious demand all of a sudden. And although we talk about a very few number of vaccines, there were literally, I think, somewhere around 80 different vaccines that were in development. And then you, you know, from a from a therapeutic standpoint, I don't know what the total number is, but about 80 different uh, therapeutics. Uh, Opportunity projects came to Catalan. So not only do you have the demand for the supplies for the products that you're going to, you know, that have been approved and you're producing, but you also have demand for uh, products that you're doing development on with your customers. So again, I just think it put a whole new level of stress, but I, I uh, would say that the industry's responded in incredibly well. Um, there was also um, for those products that uh, got rated orders from uh, the government, they were in assistance in terms of flowing those rated orders to the suppliers uh, that um, ultimately had to supply for those. So it, it ensured that for the most important products, whether you know one of the uh, emergency use authorization vaccines, that those products would have the highest priority from a, I guess, Defense Produ Production Act to be able to get those materials in. But then the challenge comes, yeah. well, what about the rest of the essential medicines? And that's where the challenge comes in. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. I mean, what, um, you know, how did you prioritize other customers? And um, is there anything that you think, you know, for the future, either you or the government could learn about trying to keep those other supply chains going? You know, look, I, I think there's going to be a lot, a lot of lessons learned here. Um, I mean, first of all, it, I think I think governments have realized what a, uh, a national security asset uh, the biopharma industry is in general. Um, I think that's going to lead to potentially some positive policy changes in terms of uh, how how that industry is is dealt with overall. I think uh, the industry and companies like Catalan are are now looking at enterprise risk from a much uh, uh, enterprise risk from a, a, a much uh, more real standpoint. It's no longer a paper exercise, um, if you will. And, uh, and quite frankly, I, I think we do need to understand within the supply chain, do, do, do we want to have that locally or do we want that to be sourced globally? And I think there's going to be a lot of critical decisions that will be happening over the next decade as we kind of sort through the aftermath of the pandemic what will you be lobbying for then more more local you know i i think from a catalan perspective we actually uh, are in a very positive position in terms of having 90 percent of our uh, revenues coming from basically us and uh, western europe but i would say that um certainly um all of, all of the countries are going to be looking at where their national security interests are. And, and we know that you definitely have more control. And, and you know, there was a big thing around the, the nationalization of vaccines, right? I mean, every, every country first looking after, after their own and having those, those assets in place is, is critically important. I was, uh, I was on a call with um, uh uh, someone, uh, someone from the, uh, the, the UK administration uh, responsible for economic policy. And we had a discussion because, you know, in the UK, for example, you have an uh, incredible national treasure in terms of your uh, biopharmaceutical discovery uh, assets, if you will. Um, however, from an overall manufacturing standpoint, specifically around drug substance uh, and drug product, clearly more to be done there. So we were in, in dialogues about, you know, uh, for example, Catalan and Catalan's interest in, in, in having a bigger footprint, for example, in the UK. And I think those dialogues with, with governments are, are going to continue with companies like Catalan and others. Oh, fascinating. You heard it here first. Um, we have a question coming. Yes, um, what were the challenges around... <laughs> Um, no. What, what challenges around quality control come with, with raising manufacturing capacity so much in such a short time frame? And that's for well, the audience. Well, first of all, I will, I will absolutely say that there were no shortcuts that were taken. I mean, in the end, there is a very strict process that you have to uh, that you have to go through in terms of your uh, process or product 
process qualification. We call them PPQ batches. I mean, you first have to have uh, validated suites. You have to va have validated equipment. You have to run these PPQ batches. You know, you have all of your post batch, batch testing that needs to happen. That all still happened. It just needed to happen on extremely accelerated uh, timelines. So the challenge is just the stress of the timelines, but not skipping any steps. That's just not allowed. Uh, again, highly regulated industry. Um, but um, it's just the, the stress that it puts on the overall environment because you, you're also usually you have time. You know when the launch is supposed to happen, but the launch for a vaccine needs to happen as soon as possible, right? And so yeah. um, things do happen when you're bringing up new assets, new capacity, new processes, new technology. And, uh, you know, when those things happen, you stop, you have a deviation, you have to investigate it, you have to do the root cause, then on goes the process. And this is just happening in a continuous mode. So, you know, I would have to say from a catalog perspective, our operations and, uh, you know, quality uh, employees uh, really bore the brunt of the stress, not only going into work every day, but going in under, you know, circumstances where we, we needed to solve the challenge of getting either therapeutics or vaccines out as soon as possible, doing it with the yeah. highest level of excellence and quality that we have within in Catalan and doing that in a nonstop mode. So just to talk about our Bloomington team, you know, we basically cut in half a two-year project. We did it in about a, uh, just under a year in terms of bringing up a, a whole new segregated facility, new biofilling line, 38 tons of a biofilling line that came in on the largest cargo plane in the world, uh, got installed. And then after we've done all that, now the work of 24-7 manufacturing uh, those those vaccines. So, you know, the phrase, no rest for the weary, but um, the challenge is there. And I'm super proud of uh, the Catalan team, our team in Bloomington and other areas in Madison yeah. and, and, and Maryland, and Nani, who've just done an unbelievable job. Okay, we only have a couple of minutes left, but I want to talk about sort of the future of innovation in, in this area. We have so much more complexity coming down the line from manufacturing in terms of obviously mRNA, but cell and gene therapies. How, how do you kind of deal with that and make sure that that doesn't slow the process down? Well, first of all, I'd say, um, you know, the future is all these new advanced modalities. That's just that's just fact. I mean, look, we we've never had mRNA approved product and we now have two and you know that's going to open up a whole new realm of uh, for the infectious disease and for uh, other other potential therapeutics and so forth but what's critical is is that the industry and the CDMOs that have become now so critical in partnering partnering with uh, with biopharma needs to maintain uh, themselves on the leading edge in terms of capabilities for these advanced modalities and for the manufacturing uh, that's going to happen. Uh, in the case of, of gene therapies, uh, it's not just about the complexity, it's also about leveraging infrastructure, uh, which makes it really natural for a CDMO like ours uh, with Catalan, because quite frankly, when you have a potentially a curative uh, treatment, uh, it doesn't make sense for a biotech company to invest in the capacity infrastructure when you have CDMOs that have the capability and capacity to manufacture tens of these products versus potentially one or a handful of products that may or may not get approved. So it's just absolutely critical to continue to maintain the capabilities and uh, the competencies for all of these new uh, uh, manufacturing, new manufacturing platforms. And again, I mentioned uh, for mRNA, this is a platform that's gonna change the way that we go after uh, infectious and potentially other diseases. Uh, and the industry and CDMOs like Catalan need to stay on the leading edge of science, technology, and, and manufacturing capability. Well, thank you so much, John. You've done a fantastic rundown in a short period of time of everything that you've uh, done in the last year. I'm sure you could run and run. I, uh, I think it's funny, though, that you say it's no rest for the weary, because I always thought it was no rest for the wicked. <laughs> But, um, uh, well, we're, we're not wicked at Gallon, <laughs> but there's a few employees that may be weary. Yeah.
Well, I hope they get some rest soon. Thank you so much for your time. Um, coming up next, we have post-pandemic opportunities in clinical development. So we're uh, doing this in the wrong order. We're going back to trials uh, with Steve Cutler, the CEO of ICON. Um, you have a five minute interval between before the next session and you can go to the speed networking feature on the left side of the screen and meet someone new. I think we've all been longing to do that during the pandemic um, and connect with any other attendees. You can set up meetings or direct chat messages. And um, after Steve Cutler, I'll be back to talk portfolio management strategy. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.